We now finally come to the second part of the Critique of Pure Reason, the Transcendental Doctrine of Method, which Kant defines around the beginning of A708 as the determination of the formal conditions of a complete system of pure reason. And he tells us that we shall have to concern ourselves with a discipline, a canon, an architectonic, and finally, a history of pure reason. Uh, what we will find is that the discipline is more than half of the, um, of the doctrine of method, and then each subsequent part is going to be shorter than the last, with the history indeed being very, very short indeed. And I also suggest that we will, um, we will find out what these four parts are as we get to them. Kant doesn't tell us much about it now. So let us begin with the first chapter, the discipline of pure reason. What is discipline here? Well, we really have to think of the verb to discipline, right? In a sense, maybe not necessarily to punish, but at least to, you know, by discipline, we make someone aware of the rules and train them into obeying the rules. That is the kind of thing that Kant is thinking of here. So at the bottom of A709, Kant says, the compulsion through which the constant propensity to stray from certain rules is limited and finally eradicated is called discipline. So what we are going to talk about in the discipline of pure reason is how to eradicate the constant propensity to stray from certain rules. Of course, the dialectic has been all about how reason, you know, tends to stray from rules uh, and, you know, has been trying to sort of limit that or teach us not to do that. We're going to find in the uh, discipline of pure reason here uh, also some other ways in which maybe pure thought tends to go astray. In this video, I want to look at the first section, the discipline of pure reason in dogmatic views which is basically about the relation between mathematics and philosophy. It is Kant explaining to us how philosophy is different from mathematics and why we cannot expect any success in philosophy by trying to follow mathematical methods. So what is the difference between mathematics and philosophy? Well, Kant makes a distinction here between the mathematical and the dogmatic. And with dogmatic here, we have to think of like philosophy making these positive statements, like making these claims, which would be its dogmas. We'll hear about that later on. All right. Page A713. Philosophical cognition is rational cognition from concepts. Mathematical cognition, that from the construction of concepts. This is important. Philosophical and mathematical cognition, two different types of cognition, they have a lot in common, right? Both of them are not empirical. Both of them give us, in some sense, universal knowledge, necessary knowledge. But there's an important difference, a crucial difference, according to Kant. Philosophical cognition is rational cognition from concepts, so it's concepts alone that we are dealing with, whereas mathematical cognition comes from the construction of concepts. But to construct a concept means to exhibit a priori the intuition corresponding to it. For the construction of a concept, therefore, a non-empirical intuition is required. So what Kant is claiming here is that mathematics is about things is maybe not the right word, but when mathematics has a concept, like a triangle, then it can construct for itself in intuition a triangle. Or maybe it would be better to say that the mathematician has the rules for constructing triangles in intuition. And so mathematics is always going to be tied to the a priori forms of intuition, to space and to time, in ways that philosophy is not, because philosophy has to do with thinking in terms of concepts. So, what Kant is going to do in the rest of this text is think about how mathematics works and think about how philosophy works and how the two differ. So Kant explains to us um, 
at some length, starting at A716, going on to A717. How this exhibition of, of concepts in intuition, what it looks like, right? And geometry is the easy example because in geometry concepts, we well, we are actually sort of constructing these figures, right? And again, it's not really about the particular figure. It's about having a rule for constructing a figure, right? When I think of a triangle, if I'm a mathematician, I'm not really attending to this particular triangle that I construct in intuition. It's about like the general triangle. Like I have rules for constructing triangles in general. Um, but Kant says not just geometry, right? Also in, in algebra, what we do is we sort of take these quantitative laws for addition and multiplication and so on and so forth. And what we do is we, we sort of make a sensible symbolism, right? We, we find ways to present to ourselves all those operations by manipulating symbols. And so Kant tells us at the bottom of A717 that mathematics thereby achieves by a symbolic construction, I should say algebra, uh, achieves by a symbolic construction equally well what geometry does by an ostensive or geometrical construction, which discursive cognition could never achieve by means of mere concepts. So for those who, who might tend to think that Kant's philosophy of mathematics is too imagistic, right, it's too much about images, well, you know, Kant seems to go a long way here towards a more formalistic conception of mathematics, where it's all about the manipulation of symbols, right? And how exactly that relates to intuition is maybe not worked out in much detail here. Um, but the idea is that, you know, these sort of semi-visual maybe representations, um, even sort of symbolic representations are enough for the mathematical intelligence to start working. Philosophy can't do anything like that, right? Philosophy can't, you know, when I think about causation, I can't construct cause, like a cause in, in intuition. I mean, what's that like? Philosophy has to do with the real, right? Philosophy has to do with objects, with things. That is what we're gonna learn um, on A720, where Kant starts talking about the difference between mathematics and philosophy in terms of one of them being about things. So Kant writes, now of all intuition, none is given a priori except the mere form of appearances, space and time. And a concept of these as quanta can be exhibited a priori in pure intuition that is constructed together with either their quality, their shape, or else merely their, their quantity, the mere synthesis of the homogeneous manifold through number, right? So form, shape, number, that's what mathematics is all about. It's about the form of all appearance. But the matter of appearance, like the things, that which actually appears, um, that's something that mathematics just isn't about. The matter of appearance, however, through which things in space and time are given to us, can be represented only in perception, thus a posteriori. The only concept that represents this empirical content of appearances a priori is the concept of the thing in general. And the synthetic a priori cognition of this can never yield a priori more than the mere rule of the synthesis of that which perception may give a posteriori, but never the intuition of the real object. So philosophy never works with intuitions, right? It abstractly thinks about the conditions under which things can appear to us, um, but it can't construct those things. It can't construct those intuitions. That's just not the kind of thing that philosophy does. Why is all of this important? Well, on the one hand, it is important because we want to understand mathematics and we want to understand philosophy, but it is even more important because Kant thinks, and this is where the discipline comes in, because Kant thinks that there is this temptation to believe that since mathematics is so successful, since mathematics is so good, um, we just have to use those very same methods in philosophy. If we want a very concrete example of what Kant might be thinking of, um, take something like Spinoza's ethics, right? Spinoza's ethics has the exact form of a mathematical treatment and Spinoza is not the only one in modern philosophy who thinks that, you know, if only we can make, we can 
use the method of mathematics in philosophy, that's when we're going to get sort of really good results. Uh, and so Spinoza starts with definitions and then he gives demonstrations of, of theorems um, and so on and so forth. And one of the things that Kant is concerned with here is to tell us that, that no, philosophy is really different from mathematics. You can't do that. So um, Kant talks about this temptation to follow mathematics around the beginning of A725. Uh, and then at the beginning, around the beginning of A727, Kant starts his systematic discussion of how we can see that all those you know, elements of mathematical methodology do not actually appear in the same way, at least, in philosophy. And so there he writes, again, around the beginning of A727. He says, mathematics is thoroughly grounded on definitions, axioms, and demonstrations. I will content myself with showing that none of these elements in the sense in which the mathematician takes them, can be achieved or imitated by philosophy. So definitions, axioms, and demonstrations. Kant starts by talking about definitions. And we know that you know mathematicians use definitions all the time, right? If I say that um, a circle is a line, every point of which is the same distance from some other point, okay, that's a definition of a circle. And I can give the definition, I can then construct a circle in intuition, which proves to me immediately that something corresponds to my definition. That's very important for Kant. And then I can reason with it. And so I can't really go wrong with this, right? I can't really sort of give a definition. I mean, I can give a definition that, you know, doesn't allow for a construction, but I'm going to find that out immediately. At least that, that's what Kant would be thinking. And of course, um, Kant is definitely not thinking in terms of constructive versus non-constructive mathematics here, right? That's the kind of, um, a kind of distinction, a kind of knowledge of certain problems in mathematics that only, that only appears in the, well, maybe late 19th, but certainly 20th century. So mathematical definitions are all well and good. Empirical definitions, Kant says, not so much, right? If you try to define gold, you know, you, you can, define it in one way or another way, but you're never going to know a priori that you have listed everything that is important about gold. Um, you can never know a priori that you have defined only one thing, right? Maybe there are different substances, all of which, uh, you know, have all these properties that you have been enumerating. So whatever you're doing in, in empirical sciences, you really shouldn't call it giving definitions, right? That's not what you're doing. Um, and the same is true, Kant thinks, for concepts that are given a priori, concepts like substance or cause. Because again, I mean, I can, I can try to sort of explicate what a substance or a cause is, but how can I know that I, that I have everything, right? that I have captured the entire, like this concept, which is, which is there in my, in my thinking, right? which is presupposed in experience. How do I know that I've grasped every aspect of it? Um, it's, 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 I can't construct it in the way that a mathematician can construct whatever they have defined. And that, Kant says, is why we should say that only mathematics has definitions. He says that at the bottom of A729. Or, you know, if we do want to call about, uh, talk about philosophical definitions, we have to be very careful. And so A730, Kant tells us, philosophical definitions, if you want to use that term, philosophical definitions come about only as expositions of given concepts but mathematical ones as constructions of concepts that are originally made. Does the former come about only analytically through analysis, the completeness of which is never apodictically certain, while the latter come about synthetically and therefore make the concept itself while the former only explain it? So again, take circle versus cause. A mathematician who defines a circle, defines a circle. He gives a method for constructing objects in intuition. Great. Um, a philosopher who defines cause, you know, tries to capture in concepts, tries to analyze a concept that he or she finds in, you know, human cognition. It's an attempt, right? And whether it's right or not, whether everything has been captured, hmm, okay, that is something that has to be proven through further philosophical thinking. 
So here is what Kant says, and I think this is actually a very useful methodological idea for all of us philosophers. This is like little thing A on A730, that in philosophy one must not imitate mathematics in putting the definitions first, unless perhaps as a mere experiment. Right? What if we try this definition of cause? Like, let's try it and see what happens. That's okay. Um, but, you know, it follows that in philosophy, the definition, as distinctness made precise, must conclude rather than begin the work. It is only after you have your philosophical theory of causation that you know what a cause really is, how to define it. You do not start with definitions in philosophy. On the other hand, mathematical definitions can never err. Right? We are, we are, we're always right. We construct a concept. It's always going to be great. So that was um, that was definitions. The second thing that mathematics uses are axioms. On axioms, these are synthetic a priori principles insofar as they are immediately certain. Immediately certain. So not just certain, because Kant is going to say that there are synthetic a priori principles that are certain in philosophy. That's what the analytic was all about, right? Giving us synthetic a priori principles that were certain. But they're not immediately certain, right? In order for us to know that all events have causes, what did we need to do? Well, we needed the entire transcendental deduction. Whatever the entire transcendental deduction is, it's not an immediate obviousness, right? Not in the way that mathematical definitions, uh, mathematical axioms, so let's take it as, a, as an example that um, a straight line is the shortest route between two points, right? If I construct it to myself in intuition, it's immediately obvious, immediately certain. At least that's, that's what Kant would think. Um, nice. If I say all events have a cause, well, if I think it's immediately certain, that's probably because I think it's an analytic truth, that it's part of the definition of event. Um, but that's wrong, right? I, I, I shouldn't give a definition of event as a philosopher, and I'm not after analytic truths. What I really ought to do in order to show that all events in experience have causes is write the entire analytic, right? And whatever that is, it's not like this immediate certainty. So there's something um, importantly different between axioms of mathematics and the truths, the synthetic a priori truths of philosophy. There's a nice little note here about Kant's use of the term axioms when he talked about axioms of intuition back in the analytic. So here's what Kant says. This is at A733. He said, to be sure, in the analytic, in the table of the principles of pure understanding, I have also thought of certain axioms of intuition. But the principle that was introduced there was not itself an axiom, but only served to provide the principle of the possibility of axioms in general, and was itself only a principle from concepts. So let us turn back to the axioms of intuition. Where was the... Here is the transcendental deduction, the schematism, systematic representation of all synthetic principles. Yes, it is back at... B202, all appearances are, as regards their intuition, extensive magnitudes. Or in the second edition, all intuitions are extensive magnitudes. That is not itself, Kant would say, an axiom. But it is because this is true, it is because intuitions are extensive magnitudes, that mathematical axioms are possible. Because mathematical axioms require, mathematics requires this extensive intuition. We need to have this extensive form of intuition um, in order for mathematical principles to be possible and to then be applicable to appearances. Okay, so Kant is saying, I use the word axiom, but I wasn't giving an axiom in philosophy. I was giving a principle of axioms, something that makes axioms possible. Finally, demonstrations, and again, Kant is just going to, to sort of emphasize that whatever we do in philosophy is very different from what we do in mathematics. 
um, only mathematics contains demonstrations since it does not derive its cognitions from concepts but from their construction that is from the intuition that can be given a priori corresponding to the concepts and so you know the kind of way we reason in mathematics by doing these constructions and so on and so forth um, there's there's just no no analog of that in philosophy right and so we shouldn't believe that we can just do what the mathematician was doing and then um, hope for any success right these are totally different disciplines they may work together sometimes Kant thinks that in natural philosophy they work together um, but they are two very very different disciplines all right so that was the first section and with that i end this particular video